Hey class, welcome to lecture three for church history. We're going to move beyond um, lecture one and two today, which covered persecution and toleration in the early Roman Empire, um, really Christian Roman Empire. Um, and we're going to move beyond that today, um, past the fall of Rome, and begin into the Dark Ages, if you want to define it that way. Some scholars don't want to call it that. Um, but if you know what I'm talking about, the idea communicates. So we'll start there. Um, before we jump into that, though, I want to talk about um, monasticism and um, see what that means during this time exactly. So as we talked about in Lecture 2, um, Christianity had become tolerated by the state. Some Christian groups didn't like this. Um, I mean, not that they were like gluttons for punishment or anything, but um, for various reasons they felt like it was a bad idea. And, you know, there are a lot of pros and cons to it. Um, one such group was the monastics. And rather than try to find a relationship or a tension between the church and the state, they just said, well, we're going to pull away from society and culture as a whole and just kind of go off into the deserts and worship, pray, um, fast to wholly um, consider God and to purify ourselves from the corrupting forces of the world. Um, so you have one side of the equation, you know, like um, you'll read about, you, I think you read about him last week, um, uh, Eusebius, who was a early Christian historian who just loved Constantine, thought he was, um, you know, Jesus incarnate, basically. And then you have on the other side, monastics who don't like this relationship between the church and the state, and they pull away into their own cloistered environments. This is important also, because after the fall of Rome in 410, 430, you know, it's kind of a gradual decline. Um, the church loses its security. There's no longer an empire backing it up, keeping it safe from vandals, from barbarians, from Muslims, um, from Turks, you know, whatever. Well, scratch Turks, They're, they weren't around at that time. My fault. Um, but there's also a loss of knowledge, because with the fall of the Roman Empire, libraries were lost, learning was lost, schools were lost. Monasticism is important in this regard, which is why I started with it, specifically in places like um, Great Britain and things like that. They form their own libraries, and they, in many ways, keep knowledge alive for the next three, four, five, six hundred odd years. That's another reason why some scholars call it the Dark Ages, because of the loss of knowledge and things like that. Um, we can debate about that, but it's not really important for our purposes right now. So, um, basically from 410 to about 8, 810, the church is kind of in this, you know, purgatorial zone of not feeling safe, not feeling secure, um, kind of set to the wind. Enter a man called Charlemagne, who, um, lived in France and who was in many ways the beginnings of the Holy Roman Empire. So um, on Christmas Day in the early uh, 800s, the Pope of that time crowns Charlemagne um, King of the Holy Roman Empire, in many ways kind of reenacting the glory of Rome that was lost when Rome fell. So this creates the precedence that was set before with Constantine, the church and the state have a symbiotic relationship again. So from 400 to 800, there was just kind of this um, drifting period. But with Charlemagne, the church begins to feel secure again in its relationship with um, the state. So once again, for lecture three, for our purposes, um, moving forward, we talked about monasticism and what that meant and why they pulled away, as, as well as um, the safeguarding of knowledge after the fall of Rome. 
um, the fall of Rome and kind of this uh, gray period for the church where it was kind of set in an uh, uncomfortable place. And then the reemergence of the church-state relationship with the crowning of Charlemagne, king of the Holy Roman Empire, by the Pope during this time, which re-energizes um, the relationship between church and state. And once again, as you're reading these chapters, you're going to see church fathers, theologians, once again wrestling with what is the proper relationship, what is a good relationship for the church and the state to have together. Should there be one? Shouldn't there be one? To what extent? This question is going to be kicked around for a long time to come, and, I mean, even today we disagree about it. So, it's interesting reading, for sure. Um, once again, this is Lecture 3, and email me if you guys have any questions. Thanks.